glad you didn't hit that deer. <laughs> For sure. Good morning. We are into our summer program. It's uh, Hawaiian shirts and t-shirts and no ties from this point on. Not that you've been wearing a tie all along, but some people do like to wear ties. And uh, in the summertime, we can sort of take it off and change up a little bit. So um, I always love Memorial Day, so I don't have to wear a tie. It's kind of fun. Um, and you notice that in the Pacific Northwest, no one else does for, for, the, for the most part. So I just got an email that um, U.S. military has been deployed in Washington and Seattle and some areas. So there's some stuff that we got to be aware of, uh, some uh, challenging days that we're in. So um, looking into the scriptures today, I want you to be encouraged. We're going to spend some time this summer looking into the words of encouragement through the Psalms. We have not spent time in the Psalms for a long time, so uh, we're going to do that, and I just want to ask that you uh, just uh, bring your cares and leave them to Jesus. Doesn't the scripture say, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you? And so let's just do that. Uh, by way of a few announcements, we are today praying for Ben and for Tamara and for Sean, especially in that Sean has been retaining water. So we're going to be praying for him this week. We're also praying for Cheryl. She just had her surgery on Monday, and uh, she's doing better. So Jim's back there at the back, and she's doing better. Also, uh, we'll be praying for Marge Williams. Gary's mom fell and broke her ankle this week, and so she went into surgery, and she came home yesterday. And she's home, and I believe, Gary, you're heading to, over to Chehalis today? Yeah. And so uh, we're going to be praying for Marge and for Ad as well. We love those folks. They come down and visit us often, and they've kind of made this kind of their home away from homes at times, so it's been fun. Uh, and along with that, we're praying for your request. We're praying for Casey and Hope Holinchek. They're in Bangor, California. What you don't know is that Cindy and I were asked to, to go to Bangor, California once. We were at a mission spring conference, which is where they used to have their thing near Monterey Bay, and they asked us to go and see Bangor and consider going there. And my wife went, and, I, and we went over there and uh, saw the field, and we saw Keith and Valerie, some friends of ours, who were just finished packing their truck. They were leaving that day, and the church was going to be vacant. There wasn't going to be a pastor there. But we just felt that wasn't the place that God wanted us, so that we went back to Forest, uh, went back down to Friant, where we were. And three days later, we got a phone call that the chairman of the board was killed in a head-on accident a mile from the church. And they had no pastor. Keith and Val left on that, that week, on Monday. And so we decided that we'd go where God wanted us to go, and we'd go and do what God wanted us to do. So um, from there, we went to a couple of different places. And then we left the ministry back in 2000. And I thought maybe I'd end up in some you know, shanty over on the East Coast, and my wife didn't want to do anything like that. So we came back to the West Coast, and about the time we got to... Uh, Baker City, Oregon, we got a phone call. The Village Missions wanted us to come to Ocean Park. And so uh, you guys have been, you, you put up with us for 20 years, so it's pretty amazing. We're so grateful for you. Uh, we love you, and we just uh, appreciate that the Lord would let us serve you that way. Um, we're also today praying for Micah and Andrea. I'm going to let you know that Micah and Andrea and their next communications are going to let you know that they are no longer going to be living in Frankfurt, Germany. They recently moved there, but they're going to be actually moving into a new position. The mission has decided because of the, the conflict and the situation such as it was with Noah and with Micah Snow going into his 11th year and his training and so forth, he's going to go back and get some more schooling. Micah is going to become the associate director of that Western uh, Europe uh, whole in mission uh, interest. And so, um, and when the director retires in a few years, the anticipation is, is that Micah will step into it. Um, it's, it's a big thing. It's, it's, it's almost certain that it's going to happen. And um, they're going to be down here, and they're going to share that with you here, I hope, soon. So uh, we love Mike and Andrew. We've known them since they were kids. I knew their parents before their parents were born. And so uh, I've known these people for a long time. And uh, we really love them kids. So we're just so excited how God has raised Micah and Andrea up to do the work that he's called them to do. So we'll be praying for them. As well, I wanted to let you know that uh, we start our Sunday uh, night schedule tonight at 6 p.m. We're going to be looking at some future things. Also, yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate you checking that microphone. 
And uh, also, um, we'll be here Tuesday for Men of the Cross. Um, that, that is, we're moving to phase four, boys, in spite of the fact that maybe the government hasn't opened up to that yet. If the military shows up here, oh well, whatever, you know. But we're going into phase four, so we're going into full China mode on Tuesday. And uh, uh, Paul, you haven't got enough crab for crab omelets this week, do you? Okay, well, maybe down here in the road. And down the road, we might get some. So anyway, uh, he called me the other day and wanted me to have some crab for crab omelets. And I thought, whoa, I already had a plan. But thank you for that, Paul. Appreciate it. And uh, so Men of the Cross, we're meeting. And then on Wednesday night, we have our prayer meeting. And that'll be here. And that'll be at 630. We invite you to come and take part in intercession. And we'll be praying for all these requests and for your requests as well. Um, and then on Sunday, two weeks from today, Father's Day, and notice that we didn't have the baby bottle campaign. We'll probably be hearing more about the initiating of that for the Coast Pregnancy Clinic. Um, we'll probably be uh, picking that up later this summer. But on Father's Day, we are going to go after the service over to Gladys Krubaz, and we're going to have our first outdoor summer barbecue. And uh, Gladys, thank you for opening your yard to us and your home to us. And uh, we love you and we appreciate you. And uh, um, also uh, just want to invite you to um, prepare to come as a way of a potluck. We are going to have, we're going to have, uh, I guess it's there. Are you getting it? They're, they're flagging me. The text back there flagging me. Um, they said, uh, uh, let's go ahead and have a potluck. So we're going to have you bring... Uh, Salads and uh, summer picnic things, we'll bring the beverages and we'll bring the meats and you all can do what you're going to do. So uh, that'll be on the 21st. And then on the 29th, there is a board meeting and we're going to be doing that together. So praise the Lord. I'd like to invite you to stand with me. Let's ask the Lord's blessing today. Father, we come into your presence and we ask with thanksgiving in our hearts that you be glorified and praised for you are worthy of praise. David said, make a joyful noise. And so, Lord, we're going to do some of that here this morning. Uh, you have called all the lands to acknowledge you as God. And so many lands do not acknowledge your lordship and that you are sovereign over all things. And so, God, I pray that you will impress upon our hearts that you are El Elyon, God Most High, and that you are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our trust and our praise. You are worthy, Lord, of, uh, of, of literally allowing us to come and you have made yourself so available so that we might confess our faults to you. Lord, that we might confess our sins and that you, Lord, are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How can we help but fall before you and honor you and magnify you as God Almighty, the Lord who loves us with everlasting love? We praise you for your goodness. And we ask that you'll bless us here as we assemble in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you this morning to uh, sing with us. We have a, a number of songs, and I'm going to put the ladies on edge because this becomes a medley, ladies. Uh-oh. They didn't know about that. Uh-oh. Oh, the land. 
land It reaches to the highest mountain And it flows to the lowest valley The blood that gives me strength from day to day It will never lose its power Sing that again It reaches to the highest That gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. All oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. But the blood of Jesus. We come in His name to the door of this house. We gather within for strength to go out. We pray with our hearts and praise with our Don't go anywhere, just say hello to him. So welcome in the name of the Lord. Welcome with so much in store. So don't leave without getting what do you came here for. Welcome in the name of the to ask you to remain standing for just a moment, please. I want to read scripture, and in that we are going into uh, some of the Psalms, and I'll sort of define that a little bit more for you later. I want to read for you, not Psalms, but 1 Chronicles chapter 16. We're going back to 1 Chronicles because we're sort of getting ready to uh, bring David into some exciting times here. And it says here, starting at 1 Chronicles 16, 1, So they brought the ark of God, and they set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, blessed the people in the name of the Lord, and then he distributed to everyone in Israel, both men and women, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark. So to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, and next to him was Zechariah, then Jael, and then Shemenoth, and then Jehiel, and then Mattathiah, and then Eliab, and then Benaiah, and then Obadidim, and Jael, with stringed instruments and harps. But Asaph made music with cymbals. There you ought to like that. Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priest, they regularly blew the trumpets before the Ark of the Covenant of God. And on the day that David first delivered this psalm to the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord, O oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him and sing psalms to him. Talk to him in wonder of his wondrous works. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and his judgments from his mouth. O oh, seed of Israel, you his servants, you children of his, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. 
Remember his covenant always, the word which he has commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it with Jacob for a statute to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan an allotment to your inheritance when you were with a few in number, indeed very few and strangers in it. And when you went from one nation to another and from one kingdom into another, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he reproved kings for their sakes, saying, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for the gods of the nations are idols. The Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his place. Give to the Lord, O kindreds of the people. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Give to the Lord an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Let's pray. We come to worship you, God, in spirit and in truth. You've taken the world and wrung them like a rag. And still yet, we fail to repent, we fail to trust you, we fail to honor you and let you have full place in our hearts, oh God. Oh, would you bring this company today before you with singing, with a sense of your presence, and Lord, with a sense of ownership that we belong to God, not because we've merited anything, not that we loved you, it's that you loved us and you gave your son for us, oh God. And so it's in your presence that we come and we give you honor and majesty. We pray that you will, Lord, install in us and impute to us an unction that will help us to take your word to the world. If nothing else, to our Jerusalem, right here around the church. To our Judea, the area nearby. Lord, to our Samaria, even, even to the uttermost parts. Lord, give us the ability to extend from one border to the next. And may your spirit move in a mighty way and that we might confirm that fact that you are God and you are taking the land again. And even if all of hell were released against us, we stand firm in the power of the Lord. It says when we have had all those things that have been fashioned against us, we're going to take our stand because you are raising a standard. And we're going to keep on the armor, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith and the power of prayer all at work, God, letting us be the soldiers for you in these days. We belong to a monarchy, not to a republic, not to a democracy, not to some kind of a dictatorship, not to some kind of a, 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 a kingdom rule. Lord, we belong to a monarch and his name is Jesus, who is Lord above all else. Help us to honor him with our lives and with our sacred honors. And we ask that you'll bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. While you're being seated, I want to remind you that uh, we have uh, an opportunity for you to give here. We're going to have our ushers prepare for our offering this morning. We've also got something to give to you, and that's on the back table. We have some more of these truelife.org cards. And these truelife.org cards are packs of five. And you can take one of these, and on the back there, the truelife.org, you can go ahead and begin your offering. You can, uh, you can take this card and you can hand it to somebody. And at truelife.org, there are places all over that site that will answer hundreds of questions that you might have regarding issues in life. So if you would, please grab another uh, pack of cards, take it and give those away. I have to tell you that I had an opportunity to give some away this week and uh, I didn't have mine with me. And I felt so bad and I thought, oh. I didn't mention it last week like I was going to on the last Sunday of every month. And so I wanted to let you know that they are there. And I'd like you to go ahead and grab you a pack. Take them. Give it to a friend. Even if you've given them a pack before, they've probably run it through the washing machine. And they need another one. So you take one of those and you give those away. They're yours to give away. Also, I want to let you know that we have uh, almost a thousand copies of the Jesus video. We are in a plan of preparation for uh, working with getting that out. But I am handing today, uh, with your approval, I'm handing over 80 of those for the senior class of 2020. Is that okay? 
Can I give 80 of those away? All right. So those are going with, uh, with your prayer that they would make an impact on the gifts that are going to be given in the name of Jesus. And so we'll go ahead and bring those uh, uh, forward and let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Thank you, guys. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for your goodness. I want to thank you that you have provided for us every good and perfect gift from above. From the Father of light, you are. You are the one who never changes. And so we give back a portion of what you've entrusted to us, Lord, that you would use it for the furtherance of your kingdom plan here in Ocean Park, here in Pacific County, here in Washington State, here in the USA, and around the world. Oh, God, we thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, fellas. Appreciate that. I'm going to spend a few minutes here in prayer. How many, how many have been feeling a little bit challenged during these last two and a half months? Not just with cabin fever. Just wondering what God's doing, maybe. Let's go to him in prayer. Our God, we come before you with thanksgiving. And we thank you that you have made us you know us. We're just the sheep of your pasture. And we would easily go astray if it were left up to us. But we resign. We take up our cross and we follow you, Lord Jesus. And we pray that you will use us in your kingdom plan. I love it, Lord, what you said when you gave it into Matthew's hearing. And he wrote it down. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added. Don't worry about tomorrow. Sufficient today are the evils thereof, and we've seen some of those evils. And Lord, some of us have gotten off our nut, and we've become angry, and we've become frustrated, and we've become literally in danger of sinning, if not have fallen into complete transgression. O oh God, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we might serve the living God. And I want to thank you that you have been so patient and so careful. You always are, and you bring us into your family, and you make us mishpuka. You make us your own children, and I praise you for that. Father, I want to just pray for Ben and for Tamara, that you'll just minister to their bodies, to their minds, to their hearts, to their will, to their emotions, but even more to their spirit, that they would have joy in the Lord. Where Tammy hasn't been able to sleep for a couple of days, and Sean is sick and has some swelling going on, oh, I would pray that you would just touch down in that place and give them a joy in the Lord. Even if, the, even if the peace seems to be fleeting, give them an internal joy, not because of what they've got or where they've been or what they're experiencing or anticipating, but, Lord, because of whose they are. They belong to you. They've been bought with a price. They're not their own anymore. They belong to you, God. So would you fix your own and touch them and bless them and keep them and strengthen them in the name of Jesus. Father, I want to thank you that you're ministering into Jim and Cheryl's life. Thank you that Cheryl, after she hadn't had the opportunity to get her surgery performed, Lord, they just call her and then a couple days later she's in there and she gets it done. And she's on the path to recovery and things are going well and I pray for her and Jim to be blessed. I want to thank you that God, when Marge fell the other day, just outside of her own house, when she fell down and she broke her ankle, there was a chance for her to get her out her cell phone and make a phone call and get immediate help. She could have stayed there and been lost and out of sight of everybody behind that flower box. <laughs> and Lord, you made it so that she could make the arrangements to get help. And now they've done surgery and I know she's uh, going to have a season of recovery. So would you just give her a quick healing and give Ad the encouragement by bringing people into their life and the resources they need to accomplish the wellness that she wants. I want to lift up my brother Dean today, Lord. I know that he's been struggling, had this pancreatic cancer battle for a long time and he's going through a lot. So I just lift him up and him, Pam and the whole family Pray that you'll just touch Dean, give him a joy for this season, Lord, knowing that he, he belongs to you. We sing that, I belong to God, I belong to Jesus, saved by his power and washed in his blood. And we are, and Dean is, and I thank you for him, and I pray you'll touch him. You are Jehovah Rapha, and you are the God that heals, and you can heal Dean today. And I pray you will in Jesus' name. Father, I want to thank you that you are ministering also to my friend Butch, who's been battling his cancer for 22 years. Lord, and he's home, and he's not too strong today and a little bit reticent to start the project that he's wanting so much to get done. I just pray that you'll help us to, as men of the cross, step up and be able to aid and assist him and 
and see that get done. Thank you for Greg going over there and serving him the other day with an admirable effort. And I thank you that you've used your people, Lord, to bless others in the kingdom service. I want to pray for Casey and for Hope. There they are in Bangor, California, a field that's been afflicted with deaths and fires and challenges and droughts. And there's been times where they've actually been in the throes of potentially being uh, wiped out with mudslides and stuff. But in the other times with droughts, Lord, um, it's a place that uh, you called them to. Others have been called there. Nick and Marion were there. Keith and Val were there. There were others people there. Rich and Ellen were there. Others have served you there, and it's a good place. And now you've got Casey and Hope there, and I pray that you will give them a blessing. Thank you for Casey's knowledge. Thank you for his talents, his education. I pray you'll just use him there in that little field of less than a 1,000. But it makes a big impact uh, in that region. So use him there in Bangor. I thank you for Micah and Andrea and for how they've been called of you and they've been obedient to follow that call. And they've gone over to uh, Grenoble, France and ministered to all kinds of students there, have won favor with a number of Muslim couples and even have prayed with a number of them that they might find Jesus. Oh Lord, I thank you that you in your timing decided to bring them to another level and to take them to Frankfurt, Germany where they were going to serve closer in a more uh, administrative way to minister to all those teenagers that serve as children of missionaries there in the greater Europe mission fields. Kids that have thought about taking their own lives or have been thought about getting caught up in, in the things in rebellion to their parents with uh, all the sex, drugs, and rock and roll and the junk that the world throws at them. They've been susceptible to it. And Micah and Andrea have been key and instrument in leading them away from the vices of sin to the victory of Jesus. And I pray that you'll bless them as they now step into this period of prayer and transition of, that, that seems to be approaching them. And God, would you just bless Len and Marlene and Tim and Sue as their parents who have been watching their kids go to work and do things for, for the exploits of the kingdom. And I just pray that they'll all have a, a sense of, uh, of appointing and an anointing uh, that, that they, as they enter into this season that you'll bless them and keep them. Do that now, and I pray that our field, Father, would be open and ripened so that we can touch it for Jesus. Touch this little church. Touch every church up and down the peninsula where the gospel is proclaimed. And God, where the gospel is not proclaimed, may you just purge that pulpit with dead works and bring the living truth of the word of God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hurting and broken with air, overwhelmed. 
by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide
Matthew you stand. song right now that's a takeoff of a uh... <laughs> change that up a little bit something Spencer I need you to go ahead and fly these frames for me this song that we're gonna do right now is a song that was written by Horatio Spafford it's taken from the best-known song it is well with my soul Horatio Spafford was over there in uh, Chicago area, him and his wife Anna, in about 1970, excuse me, 1871, started having their family, living in a little cottage uh, out there in Chicago, and, and Horatio himself was a lawyer. He was a well-known uh, lawyer and also a musician and an artist and did some things with Iris Sankey and so forth, and they had a little boy, they didn't uh, escape tragedy, they had a little boy who died young from complications to pneumonia. And then also in the 1871 Chicago fires, his business was destroyed, much was uh, laid low. Uh, and, and so Horatio had booked an arrangement, but he had to stay home behind, so he put, uh, booked his family on the Ville de Havar, ha, ha, Harava, or whatever you say that. And it was out in the sea in the North Atlantic when it was hit by the Loch Urn, a steel cruiser ship, and it sunk within 12 minutes, killing 262 of the 313 passengers. Now, Anna was saved, but the children were lost. The children were Bessie and Maggie and, and, uh, and, and Toretta, and I can't remember the name of the other one, um, Annie. And they were all lost, and when she got to, uh, over to uh, Wales, and she wrote and she said, uh, saved alone. That was the story, that she was saved alone, and then she asked, what shall I do? That was her telegram from Western Union to Horatio. Horatio Spafford then booked the, uh, the next uh, boat over, and when he got to the place where the boat went down, he wrote the words to, it is well with my soul. And today, Horatio Spafford and his family are all born, or excuse me, are all buried in Jerusalem. And so uh, this song, It Is Well With My Soul, 
has touched many. Well, you, you know the song, When peace like a river attendeth my way. Well, that song was visited by a number of um, Irish uh, musicians, um, Phil um, Begali and Stuart Townend, one of my favorite writers. And uh, they put together a little uh, counter melody and they put together a couple of other um, items for, uh, I guess you could say, for faith and understanding. And they rewrote the song. And so we want to do this song today for you. And the words are going to be up there and you can sing along with us if you would like to. He was supposed to do that while the story was going on, but that's okay. You ready? Fired up, buddy? Ready?
Uh, we're so not tech savvy. I need professionals. In fact, I need two of them back there. Spencer and John, thank you for your help, buddies. Appreciate that. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn to the book of Psalms. If you looked at the book of Psalms from the very get-go, you'll find that uh, there's 150 of them in there. It's understood that about half of them were written by David, but some of them are written, attributed to David, and sometimes the inscriptions or some of the introductions, there's about 53 of them throughout the book of Psalms that tell that it belonged to somebody, the master musician, and sometimes it might have been written by the sons of Korah. In the case of the Psalms that we're going to be looking at this summer, the Psalms of Asaph, there's a reason for that, by the way, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. When we're looking at these Psalms, we're talking about a series of them. Asaph, that we know, wrote 12. He wrote Psalm 73 through 83, and he also wrote Psalm 50. And Psalm 50 is kind of unique, and it's set apart from the rest of them, because there's, a, a, there's a, a, a doxology within the 50th Psalm. And the 50th Psalm is written... Uh, by Asaph, and then the 51st Psalm is written, then the, the Psalm of Confession, when David had fallen into adultery with Bathsheba. And so it's interesting that it was placed to give God all the glory and then show all the, the humanness of man, right, following that. So after two and a half months of going through COVID, and after nearly, you know, uh, you know, four months of going through the book of Galatians, I was kind of striving through the midst of this thing, spending some time with the Lord, of wondering what I was going to do for the summer, I'm thinking about a series, and, uh, and I haven't done anything in Psalms for a long time, and I thought, well, initially, when we first got to January 1st, if you remember, there were people that were running around here, 2020, we're going to get to see clearly what the Lord's doing. Remember that? People that were somewhat, and, 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 and I'm, I'm Pentecostal as y'all, I just do it in English. Probably can't claim to be, though, too charismatic in that, and that I don't pr profess to be prophetic in some stuff. And so... There was people that were running around and sort of prophesying, 2020 is the year of seeing clearly. We're going to see Jesus. We're going to see all this stuff. Well, who knew but that in 2020, by the 6th of January, we'd have the notice and the White House would be on it already by the 7th that coronavirus is going to become a problem. And it was down in, in the beginning weeks of March. In fact, it was before we actually went to retreat in March, at the 12th of March, that things were starting to now get socially separated and sort of isolated. And so I, I, I think about when we think about seeing all those clear things in 2020 and 2020 vision is fine for my eyes, but you and I can't declare that we have 2020 vision for the things of God always. It doesn't matter how spiritual you might think we are going to be. I've spent the last six years going through my Bible. But God will spend a lifetime having that Bible go through me. Dan and I, we would sit there and we would spend time and we would pray and we would go through, tell what we're reading right now. I'm, uh, I, I'm up there getting close to the, the, the time of getting into Isaiah. I'm finishing up with the history and I'm getting ready to move into the time of prophecy. I've already gotten through all the books of poetry, which includes Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon. Oh, by the way, if you want to get a real, real dandy, turn your TV off, grab your phone, go find the new contemporary English version or the new living translation, and just take in the Song of Solomon. Woohoo! Talk about getting your jollies. Woo! So you don't know what's happening. You, don't, I, you and I don't know what's going to happen. And so when I'm looking at the world, if I'm looking at it through the lens of CNN or, or, or somebody on Fox or some news commentator at ESPN or the world of Disney or in some place of whether it's through entertainment or whether it's through sports or whether it's a cooking channel or a flip your house or whatever it is, and those things become my source of information 
and I just leave my Bible sitting dusty on the shelf and just take it in for like 10 minutes for a day, thinking that I've sort of supposited my, my devotional moment. I'm good for the rest of the 120, uh, 167 hours of the week because I spend 10 hours a day a few days. It's not going to get my, uh, my, my spiritual thinking uh, clear. My, my spiritual eyes are going to be very dull and will need some correction indeed. So as I look into Scripture, as I pray over it, and consider its principles, and I bow before it, and I, and I see the character of God, and I confess my faults, and I bow before him and surrender to him in worship, and I yield to the power of the Holy Spirit at work in my life, I begin to then get a handle on the fact that in the days of turmoil, God's still God, and he's still good. And I can trust him. You see, in it all, as I go through the Psalms, we look at the Psalms as being a book of encouragement. When I think about the Psalms, you know, Daniel and I used to kind of get around there, and we start off, and, and, and the word of encouragement, the Psalms are literally uh, the word, it comes from the word tahilim, uh, or the book of Psalms, or the book of Psalmoi, which is in the Greek, and it literally means a hymn of praise. And this is a hymn of praise. We used to recite this to ourselves, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who heals all thy diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with good life, who satisfies your mouth with good things, who renews your strength like the eagle. That's what the Psalm 103 begins me out thinking. I get to think about the fact that God literally has set about so that I don't forget God. In fact, the reason that there are feasts for the people of Israel, which we in the church typically have dissected from, the feasts are there to remind them that in fact God did the work in the first place. You know, the feast of Passover is remembering that the, the Israelites for 400 years were in bondage. You'd think for, for 74 days you were in bondage. They were socially isolated from the world and in bondage for 40 400 plus years and God moved them out and God told them to remember and then God told them also to remember the feast of harvest the first of fruits the feast of first fruits and when they got out into the wilderness in the very first month that they were out there what did God do after they left from the land of Egypt and they crossed over the mountain of the Sinai Desert and then they went through the Red Sea with the walls sticking up on them. Well, don't let CNN or some kind of history channel tell you that they went through the Red Sea with water about six inches high because they didn't drown in mud. They don't have walls of water in the Red Sea. Turn that thing off. God tells us what he did. And when the Jordan River, and I've seen the Jordan River when it's flowing like crazy, when, he, when, when the priests stepped their foot in the Jordan River, that says that that wall of water went up like a heap and it ran up river. That's a 120-mile run from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea, 120 miles doing this, all the way down, and they stopped it just above the, the, the Dead Sea. And they walked across on dry ground. God's done some amazing things. And we think that the, the, the History Channel is going to care about Jesus and tell us the truth? Yeah. Hang the History Channel. <laughs> Turn that thing off. David will say a hundred, he, out of 150, 75 of these precious gems, these, these precious gems were, were tools that God was going to use. I mean, just think, you know how it starts off. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He should be like a tree planted by rivers of living water, which shall bring forth fruit in its season. And whatever he does with it will prosper, and his leaf shall not wither. The way of the ungodly are not sober, are like chaff which are driven by the wind. Therefore, the ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in, this, in, in, in the time of, uh, of the judgment to come. I haven't got it fully in my head. It says, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. And I've got a few of those psalms memorized. And they remind me of the goodness of God. 
And the Psalms are for encouragement. And when people are discouraged, and I'm thinking that probably during this time of being in this coronavirus pandemic, some people probably would have been well to just sit down, turn the TV off, shut that boob tube down, and start reading the Psalms. Did anybody, did anybody read the Psalms during the coronavirus corruption? Thank you. About a month ago, I was reading through the Psalms, and I was going through that, and it hit me that Asaph was talking about things like what we're going through right now. When he went through it back then, and see, he was susceptible to the world, and he had his CNN and his Fox News and his ESPN and all his stuff going on, had his cell phone going and everything. No, he didn't. <laughs> but he was socially connected. Asaph was, and he was sort of watching the crowd and kind of going that way, and, and, and God just got a hold of him, and he backed down, stood down, and, oh, God. And then he started seeing things from clarity perspective. And so Asaph, he builds from Psalm 73 to 74, 5, 8, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, up to 80, and then on to 81 and 82 and 83. And it just sort of, it's, it's like a, a building of this glorification of the handwork of God. And Psalm 50 is, in effect, like a doxology. We'll get there eventually. When I look at these psalms, it's kind of an interesting thing that in the scriptures, if you've got your finger in Psalms, take a look at something with me. 118, just find that. Now reach down with your finger and put your finger right on verse 8 at the end of it, right between verse 8 and verse 9. Find Psalm 118, put your finger, if there's a pew Bible, if you don't have one with you, and if you have a pew Bible, what, what, what page is the pew Bible? Does anyone know? 544, is it? So, okay, so if you turn to 544, if it's in the pew Bible there, you can turn there and you can go to Psalm 118, and between Psalm 118, verse 8, and Psalm 118, verse 9, you are finding the very middle of the Bible. That is the very middle of the Bible. Of all the words in the Bible, over 6 million of them, character-wise, of all the words in the Bible, that is the very center of the Bible right there. And on the east of that, you find Psalm 117, the shortest psalm in the Bible. Two simple verses. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Laud him, all you peoples. For his merciful kindness is great towards us, and his truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. That's the shortest psalm in the, in, in the book of Psalms. And that's what psalms are, little statements of praise, little statements of, and, and, and in a sense, you could say they're choruses. They're places that should have hymns or melodies or songs behind them. Now, on the west side of that, on the other side of that, is Psalm 119. And it happens to be the longest psalm in the book of Psalms. 176 verses. Every one of them, except for two of them, which are indirectly related to the Word of God, are directly related to the very Word of God. The statutes, the promises, the covenants, the law, the Word. They're all relative to the Word of God. And if the psalmist thought that the word of God that would give us the biggest psalm in the book of Psalms, just to the west of, just to the other side of, of, of the fact that at the sunset side of uh, the middle of the scriptures, you'd say, and it was all about the word of God, I think that the, the, there's something kind of cool about that, that the word of God's important. In fact, Psalm 119 is written in 22 different chapters, and there are eight stanzas in each one relative to the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and uh, eight, we'll have to figure that out another time. But here's this incredible place of psalms. The psalms had song leaders, and these song leaders were there that were, were giving a praise to God. And, and a lot of times, there's been people that have tried to identify in the psalms, and they've written marginal notes down through the years, and some of the marginal notes have now become inscribed in as part of. doesn't mean that they're not... Uh, overseen by God, but we might see sometimes in one Bible where it's part of verse 1 and it's not really part of verse 1 because there was no verse 1 when it was written. There was no verse 1. There was no chapter 118, 119, and so on. There weren't chapter breakdowns. There weren't divisions by chapter. There wasn't numbers to the scriptures. They were just written because they were significant on the hearts of the people that were believers. 
And these psalms and, and the word of God is literally kind of giving us a picture of God. We talk about God as being indescribable. We talk about God as being unstoppable. We talk about him about being the unchanging God. We have all these descriptions about God. We have these explanations of how God is, who God is, and where he is, and how we should praise him from earth into the beauty of his sanctuary. But God tells us enough about himself that gives us a little bit of an understanding, but we do not know exactly how or who and where God is. So the word of God gives us a track to run on. It gives us a sense of moving in and, and it helps us to get clarity. How many have had your eye tested? How many have been to an eye test? And the doctors told you you needed glasses. Mm -hmm. You got them on right now. You got to get correction. You know, in fact, if you don't have correction, you're in a sense driving down the road. If you're supposed to have corrective lenses and you're driving without them, you can get a ticket, right? You can, it breaks the law. It breaks the law. God's given us an ability, and he says, your words were found, I did eat them. They became to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart, my, of, of my heart because I am called by your name, O Lord God, Lord of hosts. Elohim Tzavaot, the Lord of hosts. And so you have these psalms, and especially the ones by Asaph. David wrote, Moses wrote a couple. You have some by the sons of Korah. And Asaph happens to be one of the more prolific writers in the book of Psalms. We know a little, about, a little bit about him. We saw him in First Chronicles. We saw him in First Kings, Second Kings too. Asaph was around from the time that David began to come in and celebrate at the tabernacle till the time that then Solomon came along and built the temple and then when they dedicated the temple. So for almost 40 some years, Asaph was a right hand man to King David and probably was one who was collaborating some of his insights in God to how he would be able to put that down into the scriptures as Psalms that we revere today. Asaph was one of his compatriots. The Psalms, are just, they're, they're, they're laid out there in the prophetic. They're laid out in poetic. They're laid out with personal sentiments. They're laid out for textual encouragements. Uh, it, they're built on metrics. They're built on parallelisms. They're built on rhyme schemes. They're built on comparisons. They come in a variety of sizes. They come in five different sections. They have the section that begins in Psalm 1 and it goes up to Psalm 42. They're one section. Jewish scholars decided that was one particular type of, of, of psalm. We'll talk about them at another time. And then from Psalm 43 to Psalm 72, there's another type. And some of them psalms get in there. They're called imprecatory psalms. Have you ever heard that word? Imprecatory psalms. You know what that means? Smoke them, God. It means you're angry. It means you're intentional. You're, you're praying in such a way as you're wanting God to reap uh, a harvest of judgment against the enemies of him. And you're praying in the sense, releasing God, giving him the freedom to do exactly what you think should happen. Doesn't always mean that God's going to do that because sometimes the one that needs the, the spanking is you and me. But there are places where imprecatory psalms are the heart and the intention of the psalmist. And then from 73 to 90, we have a set of psalms those that build up to give us the picture of his majesty and working through the, the broken. And then up through 90, up through 106, and then again 107 out to 50. Psalms of praise, instrumentally, uh, spiritually, socially, culturally, psalms of praise. When we look in the scriptures, we aren't necessarily doing a character study, but in the, in the psalms, we get to hear about the attributes of God. In the Psalms, we get to hear about the perfection of God. We get to, in a sense, taste the works of God. We get, in a sense, to see the, the provision and the providence of God. We get to feel the grace of God in the mind of the psalmist. He understands that God, in his wisdom, God who is in control, God who is over all the heavens and all the earth, in his holiness, is doing exactly what he plans to do. And see, from man's perspective... We are finite. We have endless, we, we have a, a very finite, unending view. God's views of everything is endless. You see, God already knew about coronavirus before he made the world. 
He already sent his son, Jesus Christ, who died 2,000 years ago, who shed his blood, who was buried on the, after, after he died on the cross and was buried in the grave and rose again. The scripture says that in God's mind, he had already had him slain as a lamb from before the foundations of the earth. God knew he, what he was doing all the time. And so these writers of the Psalms, and especially Asaph, are making confessions with an attempt to understand God. In fact, as I was thinking about this this last week, it came to me that there are a lot of people that have written a lot of books that are, in a sense, like people that write songs. And I'm going to share one with you in a moment. They write books sort of trying to express what God is like. John Bunyan, 400 years ago, wrote a book called The Pilgrim's Progress. And he tried to describe what the, this this mortal coil and this this movement from uh, being lost in our trespasses and sins to walking into the sanctification and preparation to moving in to our eternal home with God and he wrote that down in allegory and in a sense it's his own psalm it's a long one but it's a good one too some of the psalms teach some of the psalms convict some of the psalms chastise. Some of the psalms are promises for you and me. When I think about the psalmist Asaph, Asaph was one who cared. He was a faithful man. His family was faithful. He didn't desert the Lord. He was tempted, but he almost fell away. But then he came back and he put himself back under the guise of God's grace. And this guy wrote a psalm for Asaph. I'm going to do this. The sons of Asaph, scripture says, were in their place that day of days, when good and last restored the day, a worship of the one true God, sing alleluia. Who Asaph was, you rightly guess, a chief musician, nothing less, who taught his choir the Lord to praise, with cymbals, harp, the psalteries raised, sing alleluia. The future choirs for his name, like him made excellence their aim. their place and sang the song of sovereign grace sing alleluia so God be thanks these sudden days for all who still inspire our praise who teach the arts as God has given and lift our souls from earth to Sing Alleluia. Then let us cherish more and more our right to worship and adore. In Him, no and psalm and songs. To God, to whom our life belongs. Sing Alleluia. Came, it's called the Song of Asaph. And uh, I found that there's no music for it. And so I went ahead and took the meter and I looked in the hymnal and I found something that was close to it. There was only one song that would fit and that was that, uh, Oh Love That Would Not Let Me Go. There's probably a, a, another one in there, but I couldn't find one necessarily. But that song tells that Asaph was one who was a musician, who taught his choir, who praised the Lord, who used his cymbals and his harps and his parts, 
And he brought people who were part of the, the faithful crowd to become worshipers of God. He inspired worship in the hearts of others. He inspired worship in the heart of David. And we revere David. Why? Because when Jesus Christ returns, he's going to sit on the throne of David. You're going to meet Asaph one day, and so you're going to get to know him over the next few weeks. In Psalm 73, it's a fairly lengthy psalm. This is the third book of Psalms. It's a psalm of Asaph. I'm just going to kind of go and unpack this a little bit. It says that God is good to Israel, and God is good to those who have a pure heart. So immediately I have to ask, is my heart even close? If God is good to those with a pure heart, then I can't sit here and run down Trump or run down President Obama or run down Nancy Pelosi or run down Governor Inslee. As much as I like to slap one of them now and then, I have to pray for them. I have to do a Christian thing and I have to be ready to witness to them and love them in Jesus' name and pray for them when they, in fact, don't necessarily love God in return. They're not able to take the high road. They don't have the Spirit of God in them, but I do. So I'm the one that has to take the high road. And you know what? That's hard because you have to sacrifice your will and your mind and your emotions to do that. That's where the battle's going on. The body is going to go into the ground. We already know that. Some of us are getting closer than we used to be. The spirit has already been paid for. Jesus Christ paid once and for all. The blood has covered my sin. But my soul is the battleground where the devil would trip me up, trip you up, and cause you to give way to the things of the earth. We've got to be careful about that. So God is good to Israel as such of their pure heart. And then... He says, I almost lost my way here. For as for me, my feet almost had stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. I was envious of the boastful. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked, Asaph was there and he was an observer of all the, the lavish lifestyle that was going on back 3,000 years ago. Yes, there was lavish. How do you think Solomon could put up like 13 tons of gold on the temple? You'd be lucky to have 13 grams. Today, he used tons of gold. And he did it for, like, wallpaper. They lived lavishly back then, and Asaph was in the company. And he saw people that were in the company of royalty, and some of them weren't so holy, and he was, so, he was susceptible to some of that stuff. He became envy of those that were boasting. And it might have even been David's kids. Might have been his military leaders. It might have been some of the priests because he was a Levite. He was a part of the priesthood. He was one of the worshipers. Asaph wasn't, and he was aware of that. So then it says here, it goes on, and Asaph's looking now at these people with envy, and he's pointing out, I'm just going to say that in verse 3, he's talking about those who are proud and those who have basically prospered. And then in verse 4, he's saying here, for there is no pangs in their death and their strength is firm. He's saying, those people seem to be pain-free. How many of you have ever seen somebody that lived a big life, a good life, a, a, a popular life, a, 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 I guess you could say a prosperous life, and you were jealous? Oh, I know you're reluctant to put your hands up. But you see that Tesla go by and you think, oh, or a Lexus go by, or somebody's got a new boat, or somebody's in a new apartment, or they got a second or a third or a fourth house. You haven't even got flies in your wallet. And it says there, they have firm 